All right, so this is Embrace Your Inner Designer. I'm Josh, I'm a design lead, I'm also a developer at Vistacom in Sioux Falls. I just was added a title without a a pay raise, which of course is awesome, um, to become the UX manager as well, so I'm basically responsible for making sure all the sites that we do don't suck. I freelance doing some design, front-end development, um, and UX audits. I'm also the front-end developer for kidblog.org, which is the largest educational blog system in the world. I have uh, two degrees from DSU. I'm, you can listen to me sort of rant at joshproton.com and, and actually rant on Twitter at Josh Broton. Let's get started. I have ADD. It's bad. A moderate to severe, thus the reason I like GIFs. They're three second funny and then I can move on to something different. Um, this describes my life better than anything I've ever seen before in my entire life. Um, so this will happen at least one time during the t conversation today. So if it does, um, throw a MacBook Pro at me. I've been meaning to buy one. Okay, this is Ooh. epic. <laughs> it, it, it's also how I, I, I imagined open source developers before I came to my first open source conference. Uh, conference, right? Like this guy was just coding something on um, SourceForge, and then he decided to get up because his his commit worked. So this <laughs> he got up and got down. What can I say? Well, he wasn't using GitHub. No, he wasn't. So this his his stuff actually got into his repository. This you could I suppose you could rescind that and say this is the guy who actually had to use TFS and it worked like he meant to. And so, <laughs> all right. Woo. Good question, is design important? The answer to that question obviously is yes. Even, even in the smallest um, tasks, smallest jobs, smallest projects, design is important because it does three things. The first thing it does is it changes how your users see your application. And I have to stop and pause right here with a disclaimer. In this conversation, in this, to this talk, I'm gonna use the term application or website, uh, web app, app, whatever, it's all going to be interchangeable because design is equally important to all of them and good design principles apply across the board. And so your, your brain is going to have to translate that for me because my brain cannot. So the first thing it does is it changes how users use your, how they see your application. It changes how your users use your application. And third, it changes how users spread your application. And that's just a really clever way of saying it gives your application credibility. And what I mean by that is this. I landed on this site about a month ago. I was looking for a new part for my stove. I burnt out the top element because I use the broiler too much because I'm impatient because I have ADD and so I like to broil things in my oven. It burnt out and I needed a new one. So I searched online for a broiler, landed on this page, found the part for $74. I was all excited and then I realized that there is no way, come hell or high water, this website's getting my credit card information. It's just not gonna happen. And what happened, you know, what I felt like is I had landed here. Have you guys ever been at the Wayback Machine, yeah. right? I felt like that belonged there. A lot like this website does. What website? Have you ever been on this website before? Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway. Do you know who runs Berkshire Hathaway? Warren Buffett. This is his actual website. You can go to BerkshireHathaway.com now. This is still what it looks like. The design hasn't changed since 1995. Okay. If it wasn't Warren Buffett and I wasn't 100% sure that I was looking at Warren Buffett's website, I would question whether or not the financial information on this website was good based solely on its ugly look. So design is important. So let's get back to this. Oof, let's not get back to this, but let's get back to this. This website wanted my credit card information. I wasn't willing to give it to them. So instead I went to Amazon. I found the exact same part for $125 and I paid it. Why? Because I trust Amazon. This website, on the other hand, I would give my credit card information to. I would give my social security number to. I would give my bank account to. I would give my blood type to. I would give my firstborn child to. Because it's really, really pretty. And in fact, they do have all of my financial information. And I trust them completely. And part of that trust that they've built with me, not only is, not only is their reputation, but the fact that it looks like a professional, well put together and well maintained website. So m mentally in my head before I even start my relationship with them, I've begun to trust them. So the second thing that, that you know, well-designed application does besides helping your users have a better opinion of you, it, it, it also makes it easier for them to use. And that's really important. And the first thing you can do to really make sure that your application is well-designed is to think in flows and not screens. 
And what I mean by that is you need to make a, 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 a list of steps that you want your, take, your users to take as they use your application. And it can be simple or it can be in depth depending on the, the specific task that you're designing at that point. And then once you have that list, do it yourself and have your staff do it and your coworkers do it to make sure that what you've created in your application matches with what your simplified flow would look like. This is actually, my mouse is driving me crazy, ADD. Um, this is actually a flow that we use at Vistacom. This is what a typical flow will look like. This is what we want. We say we want our users to have to do when they log into our site. This is really simplified. Logging in is probably one of the easiest, most simplistic things or tasks that your users will do in your application or on your site, but at the exact same time, it's one that so many sites muck up so bad. And so this is, this is a great way, of, just on a whiteboard in, a, in your office, just scribble down the steps that you want your user to take, and then sit down at the computer and step-by-step -step follow that flow and make, make sure it matches what's happening in your app. This avoids users doing this because there's nothing worse than just bonk, 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 can't figure out what they're doing. Awesome. This is the third thing. It changes the way your users spread your application. Translation, the best marketing is free marketing. There's nothing better than your user going to their friends and saying, this app is awesome. You want proof? This sort of works. Not really, but it can. <laughs> that works much better. Do you see the difference? Sometimes when your users go to their friends and tell them about your app, it's the best way that you can uh, spread your application. Okay, so let's talk about Apples or Walgreens versus Walgreens. And really these are two very specific apps that I'm going to talk about today. One of them is really well designed, one of them is a complete piece of crap. And it's going to surprise you which one is good. The Walgreens app is awesome. Anybody ever use the Walgreens app? It's fantastic. You open it up on your phone, you scan the code on the bottle. In an hour, you go to Walgreens and you pick up your refill. It's amazing. It's well designed. It's fast. It's basically bug free and it works and does exactly what you want it to. Now 30%, and this is what's amazing about this, 30% of their refill requests now come through their app. Do you know how much cheaper it is for them to do a refill request through an app? than it is through a phone call to a pharmacist. Much, much, much cheaper because they don't pay for staff time. This is the app that's not designed so well. How many of you guys have used Apple Maps? <laughs> yes? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Apple Maps. <laughs> Absolutely, and for a lot of people, that's the experience. Heard, heard say that, but. I don't actually own an iOS device, right? So I've just heard rumors, and at this point, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, right? <laughs> I it's beat, beat, beat. Apple Maps sucks. Apple Maps sucks. But if I used Apple Maps to find the horse, that's actually what it would look like. <laughs> and so, <laughs> which is awesome, right? Anyway, so here's the truth. Back on track. A well-designed app can mean the difference between success and failure in whatever endeavor that you are attempting to do. And so make sure that what you are doing is well-designed. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's pretty, it just means that it's well put together and the user experience is awesome because that's the most important thing. So here are my design tips for developers. They're real quick hit, they're simple um, and easy to understand, they're easy to do, and not one of them involves choosing a color palette. Um, well, actually, one of them does, yay, but it basically tells you not to, to crowdsource that, which there are some, some specific websites that I use to choose mine because um, it, it makes it much easier, and uh, I often find that my taste is contrary to what normal people like. Awesome. So first thing, make sure you have a consistent layout. This one is so important, I can't stress this enough. Um, if you need to, use a grid system. Actually, not if you need to, do use a grid system to ensure that you've got proper spacing on your app. It makes the layout of the, your application or your website so much better and even subconsciously it makes that site easier for your users to navigate. And if there's one thing you don't want your users to have to do, it's think. Because the second they have to think, they leave. And so make sure you use a grid system. This is a really well designed um, grid system based website. They're, they're using a 12 column grid where they've got um, four, four, and four, and then up here it's two, 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 and two. And so it's very easy to lay out at that point, um, very easy to navigate, and it looks really nice just by default because it's so geometrically perfect. Um, this is another really good one. They're using one column on the top, 
three columns here and four columns here. And even though the content is differently sized, depending um, on the row that you're looking at, it still looks even and it still looks clean because they're using a grid system. This one's actually my favorite grid system website that I've ever seen. Not because it's exceptionally pretty or because the product's good, but because it's so complex and yet they've kept it simple because they've adhered to the grid system. They start off at the top with one column and then they move to three and then they move to four and then they move to six and then they move back to four with an internal grid of, or to one with an internal four column grid. That's a very complex layout and yet it's very easy for your eye to navigate because they've used that grid system. So make sure you get yourself a grid system to keep your, your, your layout consistent. The next tip is use white space. I have never met a group of people more afraid of white space than the development community. If you've ever seen a poorly put together interface, everything's jammed together so tightly that you can't, it's barely readable, it's hard to flow through, and so the, it's very important to use white space to sort of differentiate between groups of objects. That's really easy to do. More wet, white space creates a differentiation. Uh, less uses, it creates a, a logical group in the user's mind. This is, yikes, huh? This is a form I got handed when I first started at Vistacom by one of our developers. It was already in production. I, I, I wasn't able to catch it before it went out, which looking at it now, it kind of makes me sad, but it, it, the, the client liked it because it was an internal app that they were using for tracking things and then they were sending specific customers to it to fill out information. And so it was more, um, it wasn't so much of come fill this out, and, but instead it was go fill this out, which is a little bit different. And um, I got a hold of it and I, and I made some edits and, and it ended up looking like this. And before um, we were finished, we did some analytics on it. It had like a 10 or 12% conversion rate, which isn't terrible, right? If you're a marketing person, conversion rates are the, the cat's meow or the bee's knees, if you will. And, and so the marketers love looking at those numbers. I hate it, but they love it. And, and the, the conversion rate without changing anything, including the number of fields inside of the form or what is required, the conversion rate went from about 12% here to about 60% there. The only thing that changed was the use of white space in the design of the form. The reason was we broke it up. It, it ended up sort of convincing the user that the form wasn't as long as, as it was. And uh, so using it increased the conversion rate. So use white space. Can you go back to the yeah, that one? Okay. And it turned to that. Now it, it went down to like here, it was much longer after we did the redesign, but the number of fields and the number of required fields stay the same. So um, there was no actual change in the logic of the form, just CSS. So this is, this is another thing that it does. It greatly improves the readability and retention of text, and that's really important when you're talking about a content-focused site. Um, this is Pocket. I love Pocket. I use Pocket all the time. It used to be read it later. Instapaper is the competitor if you're on iOS. Uh, what they've done here is they've used white space to very clearly differentiate between the different items inside of this flow. Uh, it, it makes it very easy to see, all right, here we're looking at an item, and then here we're looking at a different one, and then here we're looking at a different one, and then a large part that's due to the white space that they employ. The next thing to do is to use color, size, and positioning to convey importance. This is one that, that I feel gets abused or misused because it's so easy to either just ignore or give everything equal importance. And um, as we're often taught, if everything is important, that means nothing is important, right? And so color, size, and positioning is so important. Uh, what is the most important shape in that white box? Which one? The red circle, right? That's the most important. How about this one? What's the most important object inside of the white box? The blue square, okay. Anybody else have an opinion? The yellow circle. The white square, what else? I would say the least like important the is the green one. The green one, okay, but that one's in the middle. How do you know that's the least important? It's right smack dab in the center. It's the one that stands out the least. It's the, it is the one that stands out the least. But here's the problem. There was more than one answer. So if you create something, a piece of content, or a website, or an application, that needs some sort of content hierarchy, and you get more than one answer as to what's the most important thing on this page, you failed. So make sure that you're using color, size, and importance to really point out to users what's the most important. Again, very easy to see here, that simply increasing the size of the headers, creating some white space and moving stuff down the page, we've conveyed the importance of the information. This is a block of text. Very hard to read, very hard to navigate, and very hard to scan. How many of you guys are developers? 
How many of you guys are designers? Content managers? Managers. The guy in the suit, haha, -ha business people. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, a good question. When you're looking for an answer for something on the internet, since there's mostly developers in the room, I'll say solutions to development problems, and you land on a page, do you read every word of content on that page before you decide whether it works for you or not? Or do you scan it? You scan it, right? You read the headings, and maybe you'll read a paragraph or two under the heading that you think is most appropriate. Can you do that on this page? You don't know what to scan, right? And I had a content manager once come to me and tell me, you know what, we're gonna have a page look like this because we want them to read everything. We don't want them to be able to scan. And I laughed at her. I said, if I can't scan a page, I hit back. Right? I don't, I don't think to myself, maybe it's somewhere in this block of text that's unmanageable. I'm just gonna read the whole thing. Like that thought never occurs to me. I'm like, screw this, I can't scan, and I leave. And so this is a block of text without any sort of size, color, um, boldness, white space to convey importance. Um, this, this is on its way. What, what I've done here is I've sort of created um, headings for different sections. You can't really tell their headings because it's not using color, size, or white space to convey importance. But um, you, know, you, you take a look here and you're starting to see some differentiation. You're starting to see um, using headings, bolding them, really brings out the different sections. Uh, using a different font, adding a little white space at the bottom of the paragraphs or above the, each one of the subsection headings really gives the eye um, an anchor that it can use to travel down the page and scan for what it's looking for. And all that is is basically using tags that HTML has already given us. This is Brandon Jones' quote, I love this. Good visual hierarchy isn't about wild and crazy graphics or the newest Photoshop filters. It's about organizing information in a way that's usable, accessible, and logical to the everyday user. And really that's design in a nutshell. I think a lot of times you know, designers give themselves a bad name because they, they get in the trenches and they design this beautiful app and they fight for pixels and color and border and shadow and iconography and typography and they're just excited about all this stuff when, and, and they let them most important stuff fall to the wayside. And the most logical people I know are all developers. And so I, th I would think that you guys would be very good at determining and, and organizing information in a way that's usable, accessible, and logical. And you have it in you, it's just a matter of using it. Next is to be consistent. This is so important. Inconsistency will kill your app quicker than anything else. Use just one sans serif font for your body font. The reason you use sans serif rather than serif is there have been many studies done that show that sans serif fonts are far more readable on a screen. It's exactly the opposite for paper. Serifs anchor people's eyes on paper, but because of pixels versus paper, they start to distort reality on, on screen, so don't use them. Now on retina displays, it's a little different. You can, use, you can use serif fonts on retina displays. Their DPI is high enough that serifs don't uh, cause the user to get lost. The problem is, is retina displays at this point are about 4% of web users, and so we're not quite to the point yet that we can do that. So just use one sans serif font for the body. Um, use H1 and H2 tags. I can't stress that enough. Use paragraph tags. The, the, H2, the designers of HTML have given us the tools to immediately be consistent in every piece of content that we create. We just have to use the tags that they've given us. Once again, you can see here, H2 tag, paragraph, H2, paragraph, H2, paragraph, and let somebody else manage the CSS, and that's all you have to do. It's very easy. This is a, a site with three different um, serif, sans serif fonts in the body. And there was a study done about uh, six years ago, and they were, doing, uh, they were watching people's eyes, and they were watching the cognitive things that happen in the brain. And what they determined is if you change the font that you're using inside of the paragraphs of text, what happens is it takes the, the brain almost seven words to start remembering and comprehending what it's reading. Because 100% of the brain power is spent, oh, it's a different font. I wonder why it's a different font. And then all of a sudden they're reading. But they don't stop reading, they just stop comprehending. And so if you make the decision to change your body font like that, um, between paragraphs or mid-paragraphs, you end up use, losing your users and you're breaking your attention. Don't do that. What about monospace? Monospace fonts are very easy for us to read because they're very good for laying out code, but they're actually very difficult for the brain to read. And the reason they're difficult for readers to read is because um, the width of your the letters is one of the clues that the brain uses to determine what letter it is. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's talk about icons real quick. I think that this is really important. Um, 
icons should only be used to add emphasis. One of the things that drives me the most crazy about mobile apps is their reliance on icons for all types of navigation. And what really, really drives me crazy about mobile apps is when they don't use normal icons. And they're like, we're going to get clever with our icon set and use something original, and then it just ends up messing with their users. Make sure that your icons are consistent throughout your UI. If you have an icon that's very specific for one function in your UI, that's the only time you should ever use that icon, or an icon that looks anything like that. And also make sure you adhere to UI standards. And I'll show you some examples here in sec just a second. Did you have a question? Well, one of the uses for icons is to avoid uh, translation problems when you're going and you have to localize the icon. Mm -hmm. that, that's why they're email. I would agree with you to a point, but the problem with icons is, is the paradigms change. For instance, um, if you go overseas, the, the, we use like a three bars for menu oftentimes. Overseas, that means something entirely different. And so localization ha between w have, has its own problems with icons. And so um, th that, w that was the original thought, but they found that the problem was just the same. It was just, a, you were just as lost in translation with, with actual icons as you were with words. Let's talk about icons some more. Uh, what's the middle button? The big middle triangle that points to the right, what does that do? Play. Play. Awesome. What if I decided that that meant stop in my app? Would that make any sense? No? But why not? If the users push it for the first time, they know what it means, right? How many times have I heard that? That drives me crazy. So no, don't mess with UI standards. Just do, well, here's another example. What's that? Repeat. Repeat? What's that? So you guys know that because there's a UI standard for icons in music apps, you, you, you know f certainly what those buttons do. You don't have to retrain your users. How about these? Let's talk about these for a minute. What's the shopping cart? Check out or e-commerce, right? That one actually makes sense. That's their e-commerce page. What's the flag? That's not the iPad? No, it's not an iPad. No, it, it, it's, their, um, it's their web and UI design section of their website which makes no sense, right? And, and so um, that's a terrible icon. How about this one? Settings? Settings? No, that's, that's their CMS integration section, <laughs> right? As a user, I would have skipped that section entirely because I would have thought to myself, WTF do I need a stupid settings set page for a website? I wouldn't have even looked at what that section is. You've lost your user. What? <laughs> settings too? Yeah, that actually does settings or configure, right? Wrench is usually mean configure. No, that's their HTML and CSS development. Yeah. What? <laughs> if there's one language that doesn't, isn't logical enough to be used as a tool at CSS. Um, no. And then how about the, the elongated mustache? No. It's a book, right? Um, it, it means print work. The, the problem is this company doesn't do books. It only does like posters and brochures. So that icon actually makes no sense there as well. And so they, because they've messed with UI paradigms, it would have been better if they would have left the icons off the page. Here's some more. I love these. I actually know the person that did this, and I still make fun of them when I see them. <laughs> what do you think that is? Browser. User or contact us. Um, that's actually their, their, their employee profile page, which, which makes a little bit of sense, but not really when you consider the fact um, that it's in an app. I don't know why they have that there. What do you think that is? Downloads? Downloads? No, that's move to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> you click that and like it scrolls some stuff up and things change. Um, groups. groups or friends or teams? Um, no, that's, that's the collaboration app that they have. Um, the, the, so it sort of makes sense, but if you don't know that, that's what you think it is and you end up in the wrong spot. How about the clock? Oh. No, that's video. <laughs> it, it looks like an old reel-to-reel -reel tape backup. player, right? No, that, exactly. You would think it's backup or a clock or a time clock or something like that. How about the microphone? Karaoke, your voice. Karaoke or voice or, yeah, it's their, it's their audio, but there's actually an, an actual audio icon, like an audio work icon that, that the world uses, and, and that's definitely not it. So, um, yeah, it, it, no, I, yeah. No, that's audio. I apologize. That's the contact us. What? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's the audio reel to reel tape player. Because the razor blade is <laughs> video, because that looks like a movie ticket, <laughs> which is awesome. Yes, of course. And then, uh, yeah, that's their portfolio, which doesn't make any sense, because a portfolio icon is a 
Polaroid, right? And so nobody uses a, a, a camera with a flash on it like that. It's just stupid. So that's a stupid icon set. This is, this is the other one that I still laugh at a lot. Um, top one is a, a raindrop. What do you guys think that is? Oh. <laughs> I, yes, uh, Drupal, he says. <laughs> It's 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 the representation of the the tears I shed as I try and figure out what these other icons mean. <laughs> no, that's their logo, and that that's basically the top of the single page like scroll jobby they've got for their homepage, which doesn't make any sense at all. You'd think that would be a home, right? Um, the next one below that is two Polaroid pictures. You 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 want to guess what that is? Gallery. Photo album or gallery or portfolio, like we talked about, because that's actually what that icon's for, right? But that's not. It's it's for their their photography work. Um, which makes a little bit of sense, but how about the next one below that? Brain. The brain. What do you think the brain is for? Smart. Look at us, we're smart, right? Uh, um, no, it, it, it's actually a list of the companies they work with. They call it their brain trust. You wouldn't know that because you've never been to this website before, but then once again proves um, that this it isn't a smart way to do icon sets. And so, as you can see, icons, if they're not consistent, will actually cause more confusion. And like I said before, if you make your users think, what do they do? They leave. Don't make your users think. This is what happens when you use stupid icons. That's your user. Sort of looks like that. And that's how you appear when you use stupid icons. So don't be stupid. Talk about color. Every color should consistently match an action. I can't stress that enough. What it do blue text? What does blue text do? It's a link, right? What if you decided to use blue text with a single underline to, de to denote a hover? Like if you hover over this, we'll give you some information. Some websites do this and it drives me freaking crazy, right? But imagine if they do that, it just breaks the paradigm of link. So it's important to denote um, an action with a specific color. Don't use blue underlined text to mean three different things. Remember that 10% of the world is at least partially colorblind. Which means that if you only use, the only navigation that you have, or the only differentiation between navigation points that you have is color, you have immediately alienated 10% of your customer base. So it's actually 20% of men because it's less than 0.1% of women. So, yeah. <laughs> there's that too. There's that too. I saw a graphic today where it was, my, it was Firefox and, uh, was that your presentation? Yeah, Firefox <laughs> In the corner glue. eating glue. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah, what's up? So is there some extension or plugin that you can put on your site to make it as if you were looking at it through code of line? No. Okay. Um, it's not specific to your site. If there is an HTML or there's a CSS3 uh, extension that's coming, it's CSS... Um, filters that, that include a desaturation filter and so that will be really easy in like is it? Does it work in Chrome now? Sweet. So I will create a bookmarklet, and I'm sure somebody already has, where you can you can go see your site partially desaturated to see if see if colorblind users also have trouble seeing the color differentiation on your site. Adobe Cooler is awesome because you it has 10 or 20 thousand color palettes, and then they're voted on by the community, and so the designers who are there vote the the best ones to the top. So it makes it really easy to pick out nice color palettes, but you can also see those color palettes um, as the 20 or 30 different types of color blindness would see them. So um, they do a really good job of, of helping you with that. So I, I see that statistic a lot about 10% of people being partially colorblind. Is anybody in this room colorblind? How about color deficient? Where you, maybe red, green, blue, purple, green, brown, red, brown. No, none of you guys are? Just never been tested? He was too. Um, that's a surprise, actually. I'm very surprised. I think that, that we are over underrepresented because you can't be a designer and be partially colorblind. I actually went into the design field thinking I was partially colorblind until I got glasses. So, <laughs> <laughs> surprise! I was telling these guys last night that I went all the way through middle school, elementary school, middle school, and I know never in an art class because they just assumed I was colorblind. And so now I'm like, add some purple, and the designers are like, that's blue. I'm like, yeah, add some blue, and which is <laughs> that's what I meant, which is awesome. Uh, this is all of the tips that we've talked about put together between white space, good icon usage, um, boldness and color changes to denote importance. Uh, it's just a really good way um, to lay out a UI.
Next tip, use typical casing. I can't express this enough. All uppercase lettering is extremely difficult to read. This is a really good example of that. Your eye uses the peaks and the valleys to figure out what you're reading before it actually starts comprehending the letters. And this is where that tip to use a non-monospaced -mono font comes in. It's actually the same story here, where your eye will start using the, the widths of the letters to determine what they are before it actually starts reading it. Subconscious stuff, it only saves your users a, a half a second or so, but that half a second if you ask Google is the difference between a happy user and someone who's left and looked for someone else. So don't do that. Um, this is a really good example of that. If anybody here use Visual Studio for anything, um, this I want to burn this menu to the ground. If I could kill whoever decided that that was a good idea, I would. Um, not really, I'm not actually violent, but I hate it. There's not a registry edit um, that you can change it back and it's the second most popular download from the website that it created it because <laughs> it's so bad. No one actually likes that. Left align your objects. This is the next tip. I can't stress this enough. Center type is very hard to read and scan. It takes extra effort, and that's not something your users give you. Right alignment is a great way to, to be contrarian or to make a specific point, but if your body text looks like that, it, your users just leave. And the reason is, is because they, what they do is they, they read, and then they follow the line they just read back and move down one. And then they read, and then they follow the line they, they just read and move down one. And if they're not lined up, their eye gets lost, and that's when you start reading the same line over again, or skipping lines, and then your retention and your comprehension go down, and your user happiness goes down. Don't do that. Here's another, another, another idea, another important tip. Steal ideas. Blaine Bartell said 99% of creativity is forgetting where you stole your idea from. I love that quote. I love that quote. I can't stress it enough. Don't reinvent the wheel. Everything's been done. Just go and get inspiration from other places. This is on the left is um, a space heater from 1964 by Braun. The one on the right is an iMac. Do you see the similarities? Yes? How about this? Yes, the iMac is hotter. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I like it. I'm stealing that. Uh, <laughs> stealing that idea. I love it. The one on the left is a dehumidifier. The one on the right is the Mac Pro. The one on the left is a radio from 1966. The one on the right is an iPod. The one on the left is a calculator from 1972. The one on the or is an iPhone. The one on the right, <laughs> zing, <laughs> hashtag troll. The one on the right is a calculator from the early 80s. Do you see the similarities? Apple stole all their ideas from Braun? Every one of them. Johnny Ives says that his greatest inspiration is Dieter Rams, the designer of all the Braun products up until the mid 1980s. And Dieter Rams says that it is the greatest compliment that he's ever received in his life. People aren't mad at you when, you when you mimic them. It's when you blatantly steal from them that they do not like. So be mimickers, not stealers. Awesome. Do you copy and paste code? That's a question I ask developers all the time. Yes, right? So you are stealing code if you consider stealing designs bad. So it's OK. B, all right, and here's the next point. Navigation must be easy. It's so important when you're doing navigation to have proper nesting. I can't stress that enough. Make sure you're using breadcrumb navigation if you can. Users love the roadmap that draws where they've come from and where they are now. Always consider touch when you're using navigation. As an avid touch interface user, I can't stress this enough. We talked this about this a little bit yesterday in my responsive design talk. But if you are using a touch device, do you have hover? No, no right? So if the only way. A user can get a piece of information is to hover over something. Is that fair to your user? No. How about this? This one's my favorite. I love this one when this happens. How about uh, uh, navs where if you hover over the top item, you get the drop down. But if you click on the top item, you go somewhere. Oh, yeah. Huh? You mean like the one on the Open West conference page? Absolutely. That's a really good example. <laughs> Call out. <laughs> There's actually a JavaScript library you can download called Hover Intent that sort of mimics that whole like you touch something the first time and it will open up the menu below it. But if you touch it the second time, you'll, you'll go somewhere. But that breaks the single touch events that you've got on your page. So it's just a bad idea to implement it. Just, Always make the top a span if you're doing this sort of navigation and then, then put that first menu option inside of the drop down. So always consider touch when you're doing navigation. This is another really good tip. Keep it simple. Don't make your users think, ever. Users hate to think. They hate it. 
They hate it, they hate it, they hate it. And there's a book out there called Don't Make Me Think. And now you're going to make me try and think of the author, and I don't remember what his name is. <laughs> It's, it's a fantastic book. It is the single greatest design theory book I've ever read in my life, and every developer should read it. Because basically, it's the second you make me think, who? Steve Krug. Yep, that's it, Steve Krug. Go buy it. It's awesome. How many of you guys have read that book? It is one of the, uh, oh, my homie. It is one, like I said, it's the best design theory book I've ever read, but it's applicable to everything in life. So just don't make your users think, ever. What? Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. This is a hot dog. How many of you guys have ever eaten a hot dog before? Woo! How many of you guys are vegetarians and loathe the idea? How many of you guys like veggie dogs? How many of you guys you know veggie dogs? Is veggie dog a thing? No? It is, but it's not very good. Okay, well, when you look at a hot dog, do you ever think to yourself, I don't know how I should eat this hot dog. I don't know if I should approach it from this end or that end, or maybe I should bite it from the middle, rip it in half and eat it one bite at a time from both hands. I don't know how to eat a hot dog, right? Yes, I have. <laughs> I have a two-year-old daughter. It's hilarious. <laughs> However, that being said, as adults, we look at that hot dog and we don't think to ourselves, man, I don't know how to use that hot dog, right? That's a hot dog. This page is a hot dog. We don't question to ourselves, I wonder what we should do on this page. Should we search or should we renew? Should we go around or should we scroll? Should we do what? That's not a hot dog. Right? And that's their redesign that they implemented about a month ago. That's not a hot dog. <laughs> yes, this is average. This isn't even really bad, this is average. And they actually call this their simple redesign, and as you can imagine, <laughs> they are no longer in business. So, just so you're aware, don't make your apps look like that. Make them look like a hot dog. Awesome. Anybody ever own this phone? Oh, yeah. This is my phone. This is my first smartphone, Samsung SCHI 760. It's all kinds of awesome stuff. CNET said it was the next big thing. And the reason they said it was the next big thing is you could make phone calls without having to open the keyboard, which was awesome, right? And it had a stylus right there in the top. And you could pull it out and you could tap on the screen. You could navigate with that. And you could do all kinds of stuff like download apps. Huh? 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 And this was really cool. And CNET said that this was the best phone they had ever used. And then a month later, this came out. <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, um, that wasn't so awesome anymore. And that was supposed to sell millions and it ended up selling about 35,000. This went on to sell almost 400 million. Want to know why? Because it's, it's a hot dog. And we always thought it was an apple. Yeah. <laughs> apple branded hot dogs. 10 bucks a pack. But man, are they tasty. That is... They might not be, but they'll look good. They'll look good. This is my daughter. She was a year and a half old when she's in this picture. She's able to pick up an iPad, turn it on, unlock it, open the game she wants to play, and play it without any help from us. She was a year and a half old. That's a successful user interface design. If a year and a half old can use your app, that means you've done a good job. If they cannot, you've failed. And I always get the one guy in the room being like, I write software for engineers. How am I supposed to make it usable for a year and a half year old? And the real translation of that is this. Every industry has the relative one and a half year old. The dumbest guy in the room, right? The guy who's a dunce that you don't ever give something important to do, instead he's the data entry guy. Because if you give him something important to do, he's going to break the world. You know that guy. If that guy can use your app, you've done a good job. That's a successful design. But you have to make sure the one and a half year olds can use it. Yeah. There are people that want particular features that other people don't like. Mm -hmm. like when something's designed for a one and a half year old, mm -hmm. sometimes it's incredibly frustrating because you want to be able to do something mm -hmm. more technical. Right. Easy answer to that question. How many of you guys play World of Warcraft? Wow. How many of you guys ever played World of Warcraft? Okay. How many of you guys have ever played a video game? <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd get there. <laughs> when you load up a video game, especially on a computer for the first time, but I know it, it works the same on, on consoles too. I'm not a console gamer. I'm not a gamer. But you load up a video game for the, for the first time. The controls are set for you. They're exactly how they say in the instruction manual. You can rock and roll because it's just easy, right? Maybe not easy, but it's as easy as it gets. If you're an advanced user and you want to change the controls around because you, you, you use it differently, you can change the controls around and make it more advanced. That's a good user interface design because you're giving the user the choice on whether they want it simple for a year and a half year old or difficult for a, you know, a 20 year old.
Um, the problem lies in where you assume that the one and a half year olds will learn how to use it like a 20 year old. And so you make it difficult out of the box and then give them the ability to make it easier. Always reverse that, always make it easy and allow a user to, to complicate it. Yeah. Yep. And I was talking to a friend um, who does user interface design for iOS apps. And he ha has a couple of really big, fairly popular apps that are in the App Store. And one of the things he does is when he releases an app, the f it's feature complete. Right? Like it's ready to rock and roll. But he releases a version 1.0 with some of those features removed to allow users to learn the app before he adds them in version 1.1 a week or two weeks later. And then when he adds them, what he does is for users who are new users to the app, they get an extra set of instructions how to use both of those feature sets. And so he does a really good job of sort of hiding away some of those features for a week or two when he releases a new app to give people time to catch up with, with his application. Yeah? So I've been on, on, on a website that I've been working on, which I've showed you, I've been working on, on trying to do mm -hmm. that. And I think we've done a fairly good job. But one interesting issue I've run into, I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions on how to deal with it, is there's almost a conflict of interest between search engine optimization and keeping things simple. With the, mm. with, with the, the initial page that you see on my website, there are three buttons that you're going to choose between mm -hmm. because there's, there's three different test mm -hmm. types that you may want to study. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really powerful because they go there and that's all they see. And like every other website that does similar things, you're just totally land blasted with, with text. But uh, then I looked it up on Google and the text that I saw was from the dialogue that you can click on and, and have it pop up and it gives you information on how to donate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which we, is not exactly what I want people to see as the first thing on my page, but it's the first real text mm -hmm. that's, that's displayed, even though it's in. Google will rank your page based on the user experience that they believe that you offer. This is an SEO, not an SEO talk, and I'm not an SEO person. I think SEO people have a special place in hell reserved for them. <laughs> However, <laughs> how many of you guys are SEO people? <laughs> One of you? I apologize. If you don't suck, I like you, but I just, I've worked with SEO people <laughs> that are like, this, this is, we need to do this and this. But uh, let me answer that question privately, but I will tell you this, that text is not a bad thing for the user experience. It's disorganized and overly bloated text. And that's why they're punishing you for key, too high a keyword density now. Because they're, they're really starting to figure out algorithmically whether or not you have good user experience from your text. You yeah. can use the meta description to try to direct that, what shows up in the search results. Yeah. Right. Do, does your do you have a meta description on that homepage? I would bet not. If it's using a, an un, if if it's using text that's not visible to the user upon landing, my guess is you don't. Let's continue real quick. If we'll have questions at the end, we only got like six minutes left. Awesome. Next tip: make action items obvious. This goes right along with don't make your users think. If you have one call to action on your landing page and it's click this button to do something, make that button huge, bold. Big font, red, blinking, with swirly things going around it, and like a lady walking out on the screen. Hello, you need to click this button. Don't actually do that, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> Don't do the walk-ons. That once again, there's a special place in hell for people who oh, who, there's a special place in hell for people who have auto playing audio or video on their website because I listen to music very loud in my headphones, and the DSP that I use m quiets the music down so the EQ levels it out. Right? But from the browser, <laughs> I've blown out two pairs of $400 headphones because auto playing music on a website is so loud in my headphones that it just blows them out. So don't do that. Awesome. Next tip make important items stand out. This goes along with action items, but it also could be titles, logos, etc. Make them big enough to see, obvious enough to notice, but don't make them ridiculous. Next one is minimize the noise. I can't stress this enough. As a man with ADD, if I land on a website with too much going on, I can't do anything. It literally cripples the way that I view a web page. And because of that, it makes it unusable for me. Think of your users. Think of, think of the Joshes that visit your website. Minimize the noise. If the stuff isn't important, just get rid of it. That's the next tip. 
omit needless items. I can't stress this enough. One of the number one jobs I have as a user experience manager is saying no to stupid features that don't need to be there. And I have clients that come to me, I would really like this, and I would really like this, and I would really like this, and I would really like this. And I, I, I always give them this quote, the reduction to the essential has never led to catastrophe. This is Dieter Rams, this is the guy who designed all of that stuff at Braun that Apple you know, copies the designs from now. But this is a very awesome quote, and the reason it's an awesome quote is because it drives home the fact that sometimes the most important thing to do is define the essential and then reduce to it. If you can do that successfully, you've created a great device. This is the, what we call um, our interaction chart, and we use this to, to, to talk to clients about why. If, if it requires thought, they ask, is that a button? If it's simple, they click it. If it requires thought, they say, is this what I'm looking for? But if it's simple, they click it. That's the difference between something obvious with no noise around it, or something not obvious with noise. The number one thing that you can do to help people like me and people like your users is when you're in doubt to the reason why you need something, leave it out. If you can't define an explicit reason for something, eliminate it completely. It's so important to have that explicit re reason. Thus, I used larger font to convey importance. Keep your instructions simple. How many of you guys have read the 500 page Photoshop manual? The 460 page WebStorm or PHP Storm PDF? The 300 page PDF that comes with OS 10. I think I opened that one once. Opened it once? Did a search on it and then left? That's what I do. How many, <laughs> how many of you guys have read the user manual that comes with any piece of software you use? Maybe one or two, right? But for the most part, you're not even reading them. The reason is, is because the instructions aren't simple. You just want the simple answers to the questions that you have, and so you use Google. Yeah. Lots of pictures. Yeah, that's exactly right, and that's a, simple instructions, right? Simple instructions. My mom can set up her PC. It makes her nervous, so she doesn't. She makes me to do it, but she could if she tried. The last thing that you can do is to test, test, test. And when you're done testing, test some more, and then test some more. And what we do at Vistacom is we call the salespeople and say, "Come test this thing for us." Right? You are the one and a half year olds in the whole like using the internet world, and so we really need you. We really need you to test, 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 test. I say that, and I'm, I, as a manager, I'm more involved in sales than I'd like to be. But you get what I'm saying, right? They're not the ones who designed it. When you click on a button, you know what function fires when that button's clicked, right? You are so intimately involved in a project that you know it down to the code level. The problem with that is, is you know how it's supposed to work according to your brain. The problem with that is you don't have testers and you get this. This was the last conference I spoke at. This was the, um, the paper towel dispenser, right? Um, these are supposed to be the instructions, but instead they had to have that sign and then they had to have that sign <laughs> because the instructions weren't clear enough. That wasn't tested with actual users. It was probably just tested by the engineer who knew how the gears work, so he knew to pull it with, with both hands. Jared Spool said this. How do you guys know who Jared Spool is? Really, a few of you? He's awesome, I love the guy. He said this, in the last six weeks, have your team members spent at least two hours watching people experience your product or service? And that's a really good question to ask. Spend two hours just watching users use your stuff. If they can't use it, if it's broken, then you know how to fix it. This is what I always ask my developers. Don't ask if your application can do what it should. Ask if your users can make your application do what it should. Because it doesn't matter if you can. It only matters if your users can because you're not paying for your own application. You're not paying for your own website. You're not the user. You're not the use case. Any questions? Yeah. So a lot of this kind of has to be designed in like the stuff you just did with that. Mm-hmm. You don't feel that stuff. It's pretty sweet. But what would you recommend? What modifications? I know you're talking about it. What modifications would you recommend to it? I don't know if it's a peripheral question. Sure. Twitter Bootstrap, does it suck? How can we fix it? And Windows 8, does it suck? Um, <laughs> Twitter Bootstrap is awesome for two things prototyping and teams without designers. Um, prototyping because you include it and you put some classes and stuff and it's a website, right? Which works really well. Um, 
Teams without users, it works really great because you can change the designs simply by changing values inside of variables inside of those less files. Um, so that works really well. Uh, my problem with Twitter Bootstrap, and maybe this is just the designer in me, is that you can always tell a Bootstrap site. Right? When you land on a website, especially one that's using the Bootstrap responsive extension, you can just tell that it's a responsive Bootstrap site. That being said, that's not a necessarily a bad thing because one of the things that made Android successful wasn't the fact that it was free or it was on good hardware. It was because they finally released a developer UI guide for the applications, and that brought the applications from like here to here. I mean, iOS is still somewhere above the ceiling when it comes to application UI design and development and user experience, but that, that just the, the standardized UI that that UI development guide brings really brought the level of application in the Android App Store up to a new level. So I'm not necessarily against a, mod, like a, a, a standardized UI on a platform, including the web, but from a designer standpoint, I hate the fact that for the, whole, for the most part, Bootstrap is inflexible. But like I said, that's not a bad thing, especially if you don't have a designer on staff. It gets you about 95% of the way to having a usable site. They've done a decent job with UX as well. And version 3, which should be out in June, I'm actually using three beta on a couple of big projects now. It's actually really good. Um, it, 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 brings a, it fixes a lot of that. It, it takes a lot of the color out of, out of the site. And I'm not talking like literally the color. I'm talking like the, the look and the feel of Bootstrap. They've done a good job eliminating a lot of that. So to, the short answer is Bootstrap's awesome for your particular use case. Um, second question is, does Windows 8 suck, especially with the Windows 8 like metro e sort of interface that they've, they've implemented? I, there are two answers to that question. One, for my mom, it's perfect, right? Everything's really big. It takes up the whole screen, but it eliminates a lot of, it uses a lot of white space, and so it's easy to navigate, and it makes sense um, for in the app. In, the whole, like, Windows 8, like, how do you search Windows 8, and how do you search inside apps, that's a little wonky with that charm bar on the, on the right side. Um, but once you get it, you get it. It's just understanding an entirely new design paradigm and UI paradigm. And the problem with that is that people don't want to. Like, Windows 7 was so good, there's no motivation to understand the new paradigm, and so they basically broke the world. That, that's the price of having a successful Windows 7. That being said, um, for me, I absolutely despise the, the complete and total waste of space that is Windows 8 Metro, right? Um, in this, uh, you can go Metro and you can use really nice white space, really nice font sizes and colors. Um, for instance, the Windows um, Metro Twit app for Windows Desktop is fantastic, but it still has that Metro E styling. But you use the Metro, the Metro Twit Windows 8, like Windows 8 Store Metro app, and it sucks because you only get one column instead of four, right? And instead of it sort of being a dashboard, it's like this puke of information on the screen. And so I, I think that they've got a long way to go to, to sort of define how to use that space properly. Yeah. So you said icons are fairly standard. Mm -hmm. You should know which ones to use. Is there a list somewhere that? Uh, Absolutely. You don't know what the standards are. Yep. Um, there is a. How do you guys know what icon fonts are? Anybody use font awesome? Font awesome. That is correct. That's one of them. Um, there, there's a bunch of open source ones, which is fantastic because what it does is it gives you a list of icons and what they're used for. Um, for instance, icon, icon cloud download. You may not use this exact icon. But you can have one that adheres to the whole like cloud with an arrow pointed down in it. Icon cloud upload. Um, icon stethoscope. I have no idea what that's for, but whatevs. Um, know what that one's for. Um, <laughs> shh. Um, Yes, rainbow. Uh, for this one, for instance, what is that? It's a bookmark, of course, that's easy, right? And so this does a really good job of sort of showing you. And that is the filter icon, which I would have never known just Cognitively, I would have never looked at that and said, oh, that's the filter icon. But I totally know what that is when you look at it in a UI. You're like, that's the filter. Click it and it filters, right? So, so it do, this does a really good job of laying out basically the web UI paradigm. And, and this font set or this icon font is used more than all of the rest of them combined. And so um, they've done a pretty decent job of, of having this become the standard. So this, this would be a great place. So font awesome. If you want to know UI standards, font awesome is a great place to go. Any more questions? Awesome. Like I said, um, my name is Josh Broton. If you've got any more questions, follow me on Twitter. But please do me a huge favor. Um, leave your feedback on Joined In. It's 8315. I don't do QR codes because, once again, I think those can burn in hell. So um, joinedin.com or join.in slash 8315. You guys have a great day, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.